Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Sorry, I'm not there in person. Um, some of you would have seen me yesterday, but I had to get home. Let me move that off the screen. Are you seeing my tab here as well? Let me move that up there. Um, so yeah, it's our pleasure today to talk about um, combining genomic resources. And um, today we're hoping to just give a bit of an overview, overview about um, you know, what you can do when you have a reference genome where you can map your um, SNP data to the reference and how this can sort of shift our understanding of genome evolution to more functional evolution and some of the techniques that are out there and um, programs and applications. So um, Jason's kindly going to go through um, a tutorial of work that he's done with some lizards. And then I do... I'm not sure, but I believe maybe at the end, Lewis had arranged for um, Craig and a few other people to stand up for discussion. So nevertheless, I'll start you off with a bit of a overview and uh, background. So this week we've looked across the continuum of um, divergence and speciation. So we've been focusing a lot on analyses at the population genetics level. Oh, I should just keep an eye on this chat line, sorry. Okay, perfect. Um, do interrupt if you have questions, sorry. Um, so yeah, we've been looking across this continuum from population processes and thinking about conservation through to deeper lineage divergence and phylogenomics. So today the goal is to um, extend what is known from those um, workshops and tutorials into what we can do when we have information about a genome. Um, I don't want to get everybody depressed, but as I was sort of thinking about this and researching, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about reference genomes because there's a lot to actually consider. And I don't want to be too negative and we will touch on the positive after, but I think um, you know, the positive is that genomes are really changing our understanding of genome evolution. I've got the, it's not a silver bullet there and it doesn't solve all the world's problems because I think there's quite a bit we need to consider. Um, so for example, where has your genome come from? Is the individual sample representative of the species, the lineage? You know, we have to think about, it's just one representative how has it been generated? And I can speak to this with some of the data we've got um, and I'll present later in regards to some um, rock wallabies, which are an Australian marsupial genus. And, you know, we started off sequencing um, with um, one approach that was more short read. And, um, you know, we know the technology is changing to longer read, but we have to think about what's the quality of the genome that we're actually mapping to and where are some limitations. We have to think about, you know, what sex is it from? How, you know, we might only have one genome. Does it represent a male or a female or what is it representing? You know, are we wanting to map to a reference genome that's been generated not for our study organism. So thinking about phylogenetic distance and what that means in terms of mapping our data, thinking about the ploidy in terms of assembly, and then, you know, thinking about structural differences as well and the impact that that might have. So my goal is at the beginning here is just to, with some examples, um, talk through some of these concerns and where you might need to really consider um, the use of the reference genome and some of its biases. So here's just an example of um, a, a genome where each of the black lines have been mapped. This is for um, Brassica napus, if I say that correctly. Um, so a, a DDRAD data set has been mapped to this reference genome and we can see like a density um, map of these markers against those different chromosomes. So each um, chromosome, A1, A2, et cetera, they're the chromosomes, and then you can see the markers and their density. And this is wonderful because it gives us, you know, this scaffold for assembly and alignment of our SNP data to a genome. And, you know, hopefully the genome has annotations, and then that can really link towards 
functional outcomes and functional evolution. So, you know, the opportunity means we can map our SNPs and then we get a defined um, coordinates of the position of the SNPs. So they're not just anonymous in where they are. We actually have some understanding of where they are in relationship to each other. And then also thinking about whether it, they represent the reference or an alternate allele and thinking about molecular evolutionary processes. So there's a lot of text here. It's just to sort of remind myself, but also if you um, have these slides, you can just read through them. But, you know, I do want to highlight here that the reference genome, it does represent only a single individual. And this can at times distort our results, depending on whether it's typical or atypical. So we really want to think about that reference in relation to our um, questions, our system. You know, it is very dependent. And, you know, often we're all kind of scrambling to make the most of our resources. So we may not be generating a genome ourselves. We may be mapping it to a distant relative. So we all try the best that we can, but it's just knowing what those biases may then be downstream. So we do need to think about whether um, it's, you know, for example, here, this paper says is it a healthy genome or is it the most common or the longest, you know, we just need to think about it. And because there can be, some biases in regards to um, mapping to references. So some reference bias, bias might be the tendency for reads to map more readily to reference alleles, whereas reads with non-reference alleles, they may not be mapped or they may map at lower rates. And this can be in particular for um, mapping to genomes that are more distantly related. And this can have flow-on effects. I'll show you um, some examples in a minute. So you can have, yeah, this decreased mapping efficiency. Um, we also have to consider, and I know probably earlier in the week, people have talked about different variant callers and different errors. So thinking about, you know, some of the pipelines, for example, GATK, where we're assembling, you know, it was designed for humans, not all um, references are like humans. So thinking about what are limitations or what are factors in terms of parameters when assembling our data against these references. Some of them are better for things that are a little bit more distant. They have, um, you know, parameters that you can adjust to a, a lower the stringency of mapping. And another um, case I'll talk about down the track is um, using consensus reference genomes. Um, or variation aware reference graphs that might mitigate some of these biases. So here's just one example to sort of highlight some of that reference bias. So here we have, um, you know, we're mapping this brown Swiss cattle to, I say we, it wasn't me, um, but this study mapped this brown Swiss cattle to two different references to the Angus and to the Hereford um, genome. And, you know, you think cattle breeds, they're all pretty closely related. However, between those two references, between the Hereford and the Angus, there was segmental duplications on chromosome 12 and 28. So we just look here and these are the number of variants called, hopefully you can see my arrow as I'm doing this. Um, so if we look at chromosome 12, we see an increase in the variance um, that when it's mapped to the Angus genome compared to the Hereford. And then on chromosome 28, we see um, a bit more variance when mapped to the, um, the Hereford rather than the, um, the Angus genome. So this is just to highlight, it can impact the number of variants um, just due to a duplication between two pretty recently um, diverged, or these are breeds of cow. Um, so this caused misalignments and flaws in the resulting genotypes. So that duplication was two times longer in the Angus than the Hereford genome. And as highlighted by this graph, it's affected the, the genome-wide number of variants, which can have effects on downstream results. I just thought this was like a pretty clear example of, um, you know, one outcome where you get different results depending on where you map to. And, you know, you would assume they would be similar. But then following on from that, if you're then getting different numbers of variants called, this then had an impact on detection of selection. 
So it's not just, um, you know, affecting, this is actually having quite big impacts on our downstream analyses. So for example, it's affected, we see this signal of a strong selective sweep based on mapping to the Hereford and a putative sweep based on mapping to the Angus that you don't see when you don't map it to the other um, reference genome. So this is just to highlight, we do need to be a little bit cautious um, when we're interpreting our results. We can't all map to lots of different um, genomes. We can only do the best that we can, but just to be aware that, um, you know, when we see things that come out as potentially um, selective, we do have to just consider our reference bias. And one thing I touched on was thinking about the phylogenetic um, distance between what you're mapping your samples to and the reference genome. So this was a really nice study um, that looked at two different um, organisms looking at the, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, the Rowie kiwi, I'll just say the kiwi and the beluga whale. Um, and what they did was they mapped um, this species to different reference genomes of different divergences. So you can see here the divergences range from 0.5% to sort of 3% for the whales and then 0.3 to 7% um, for the bird, for the kiwi. So the interesting thing here was that it really impacted the heterozygosity estimates and that they seem to deviate, excuse me, incrementally with increasing phylogenetic distance. So here we have the different um, genomes in terms of um, phylogenetic divergence with the closest divergence on the left and then heterozygosity. And you can see huge variation in the measures of heterozygosity. And you see that for both the whale and for the kiwi. But what I do want to highlight here is that in this other plot here, you can see that those heterozygosity values get much closer in estimate um, and a lot less variance um, between the different, depending di between the different species that they're mapped to. And this is because these references were generated from cross-species scaffolding assemblies. So I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's just one thing to consider as well when um, you're assembling your reference um, or if you're using another reference, how it's sort of this pseudo-reference type approach and it can minimise um, some of these deviations in genetic diversity. But what they do highlight from this study is that the genetic diversity deviations, they're not really pronounced until the reference genome is more than 3% divergent. So I haven't actually done this. I just um, found this in the literature and um, this cross-species scaffolding, basically it's a way, I would encourage you to read this paper if you're interested in doing this, but it's, um, trying to create this sort of pseudo references. It's thinking about syntony and um, it can take information from your sequence reads and using this syntenic information um, from the closely related species, it can create this genome assembly. And I think maybe later Arthur might be able to speak to this because I think he's been doing some of this syntony analysis early on before, like long read sequencing to help assemble genomes from different species where you may not have that, um, that information. This study here just highlighted though that, um, so what we have is the, the reference genome and then this cross species scaffolding genome. And what they found was um, the genome statistics really improved um, when this cross-species scaffolding approach was used. So you get a lot more con like larger contig lengths of the reference genome using this approach. And, um, you know, I'm not going to go through all the stats, but you get better genome assembly length, greater N50, um, you know, all these complete bus goes go right up. So it seems to be this really fantastic approach to um, 
improve some of the, the reference genomes. And, you know, they state here in this study that it can be used for reference genomes more than 50 million years diverged. So I just wanted to highlight this in case people are wanting to use reference genomes um, and want to mitigate some of the effects. This could be one way of doing that. So, you know, I don't like to build doom and gloom. I think reference genomes are amazing. I just wanted to first highlight that we do need to be cautious and think about our genomes that we're mapping to as well. So um, I think the technologies are getting better. It's getting cheaper to generate them. I think probably one of the hardest parts of getting a reference genome these days is getting a suitable sample to do that. And that's definitely the case with some of the work that I'm doing. So um, where you can't necessarily get the fresh sample to do the long read and have the high molecular weight. So it's like, how can we get around that? So it definitely provides opportunities having reference genomes. So as I mentioned, it gives this spatial awareness of the genome evolution. You get positions of where the SNPs are on the genome. Um, and that allows us to translate that genome evolution information to functional evolution. And I'll go through that in a minute with some examples. And, you know, we talked about it yesterday, but we do know that the genome's really heterogeneous in terms of mutation, selection, gene flow, recombination landscape, all of these processes which can be, um, you know, we're trying to resolve sometimes quite complex evolutionary processes and being able to break that up across the genome because we know the positions and we can try and understand those that heterogeneity. This is what we can do when we can map um, to reference genomes. So now I'm just going to talk through some of what can be done. So um, it really can take us from having just basically anonymous SNPs to trying to relate them to some function. So we've got our SNPs. We can determine if they're in coding regions or non-coding regions. We can determine if they're synonymous. Um, and they change amino acids or they're non-synonymous and don't. So we can start thinking about um, molecular evolution and impacts for um, you know, adaptive evolution, all those sorts of things. We can think about um, nonsense and missense mutations. And I'll give some examples when thinking about genetic load for conservation. And then we can also think about, you know, if they're in non-coding regions, you know, where are they? Does that have an implication? Maybe we'll get some gene expression data and maybe we see a relationship of, of them being upstream and having an effect on that. You know, there's all sorts that you can do by knowing where your SNP is in the genome. Um, I just thought this was a nice picture that just shows thinking about, you know, the position, the linkage of SNPs, you know, in relation to the, the gene or regulatory sequence. And, you know, this just is another way of thinking about genome function as well. One thing I do want to touch on, um, you know, evolutionary biology is fantastic because you know, we've got two kind of avenues, what I what I think anyway. We have, um, you know, the really experimental stuff where you can dive deep and you can understand something and all of its functions and relationship of every sort of gene to its phenotype, that, that sort of process. But there's a lot of systems and organisms where that's just not possible. And we have a lot of power from doing comparative studies and trying to understand and look at correlations. But one thing, you know, and this is also a note to myself that just because we're finding things that might show a correlation to particular traits or questions we're interested in or environmental factors, it doesn't mean that it's actually the cause of it. So we have to just keep in mind that, um, you know, correlation doesn't mean causation. So, you know, for me in particular, I'm interested in understanding the processes. So we're looking at more regions, but, you know, when you want to get to the nitty gritty of the functional evolution, just keep in mind that, you know, you probably really need to experimentally validate that. But we do get a lot of power in terms of 
comparative studies and comparing to things that are models and understanding, well, we know the, the annotation and the function of particular genes or regions for those, and we're seeing selection at those same low size. So there is a level of power there, but um, yeah, this was just one thing that I'm sure many, like all of you are probably considering, but I just have to remind myself this as well. So we all deal with different types of data sets and questions. And I'm not sure if anyone in this workshop is looking at the level of having experimental data, having, you know, um, F2 populations, for example, and being able to um, really link SNPs to phenotypic differences. But this is just to show you what can be done. And this is really exciting. So, you know, I think probably the field of agriculture and um, plants are, are a bit ahead of um, some of the other animal um, organismal studies in terms of linkage mapping and so on. But this is coming back to that earlier example where I showed the DD rat had been mapped to the chromosomes of the brassica and um, they were able to produce this linkage map using this, this program ASM map. So this is just to highlight, if you have this sort of data, there are these programs, you can get an understanding of linkage groups of your SNPs. Um, you can look at the genetic distance between the SNPs and, and figure this out. So that's something really exciting when thinking about evolutionary processes, understanding LD. In this case, you know, they have the experimental design. So they're looking at these um, flowers, you know, they've got different, they're, they're interested in um, flowering time and the time to bud between, I think this is like spring and another um, species, but they've got these different phenotypes basically. And they're looking for these quantitative trait loci associated with these differences. And what they find is that, you know, there's this single locus um, where it impacts both the flowering time and the budding time. So they have this experimental design, all these um, population genomics to look at this outlier, this difference between, and, and they see this, um, this QTL and this variance that has an effect. So it's linking the genotype to the phenotype from their data. And this is all because, you know, they were able to map this SNP to the genome and, and with the experimental design, get to this question. So that's just to highlight how it can be used, knowing where your SNPs are in the genome. There are a bunch of analyses out there that can estimate or predict functional outcomes um, with either experimental linkage and QTL mapping or um, just using comparative maps. So I'm about to go through an example. Um, where is it on the list? Number seven here, SNPF. Look, I haven't actually run it myself, but my colleagues have run it. And basically it's used for, well, I'll go through um, in a minute why it's used and how it's helpful. But this is just to get you thinking about what you can do with your data. So this is thinking about um, when you have a reference and you're mapping your SNP data, you can start to think about the effect of um, molecular evolution and so on on that. Um, so you can look for functional prediction um, based using these analyses. And for SNP F, what happens is you can use either the genomes that they have there or you can upload your own annotated genome and you're mapping your SNP data to this annotated genome and it looks um, and it gives you information about the annotation and about your variants. So it can give you information around simple, which might be, you know, which gene is each variant affecting to extremely complex annotations. So is this a non-coding variant, which has an effect on the expression of a gene? So the one thing to note here is that the more complex the annotations, the more it relies on computational predictions. And we have to be cautious that, you know, are these predictions correct or not? So um, 
yeah, we do have to be cautious when using this sort of software as well. And as I mentioned, you know, validating with experimental work is always helpful. But obviously, I mean, a lot of my research, we can't validate with experimental. So here's a, an example of where um, they've mapped using SNPF, they've mapped um, SNPs to this. So here we have this um, captive deer mouse and there's a high altitude stock and a low altitude stock. And what they've done is they've mapped SNPs to the low altitude stock reference genome. And they're trying to understand the landscape of diversity in their stocks and try to point to specific functional polymorphisms that could be of biological value. So what we have here are um, the individuals mapped to the reference genome and what they've been able to um, get from this SNPF analysis is are the um, variants, are the changes synonymous? Are they creating synonymous mutations, nonsense or missense? So nonsense is like loss of function um, mutations. So this gives us a sort of understanding of the types of changes that the SNPs are making um, to individuals. And, you know, this is where you really need that reference to know what where is it, what's it, what, what is it impacting, what's the function and what's, you know, the change from that. So from this study, um, they were able to see that there were polymorphisms in genes associated with inflammation, hypoxia and cholesterol metabolism. And um, they were able to assess, um, you know, these different sorts of uh, mutations and you can see there's a shift in the um, the low altitude, which is normally higher for missense and nonsense, to the high altitude for synonymous mutations. So it just gives us an overview of the types and variation between different populations. And then you can start to tease apart, well, why is that? What's the importance of that? Another example of thinking about this sort of functional evolution and thinking about this SNPF analysis is actually associated with conservation. So I'm not sure if in this morning's session um, there was much discussed around genetic load, but another um, use of this sort of approach with our SNP data I've seen um, in the literature and is becoming more of a focus is thinking about genetic load. So where you've got high levels of inbreeding, this can lead to this increase in homozygosity of recessive deleterious mutations. And this is genetic load. And it's thought that this will substantially reduce the mean fitness of individuals in species and populations. So in this study, what they did was they annotated the golden snub-nosed monkey um, no, what did they do? They took, they had five species of these um, endangered snub-nosed monkeys and they mapped them all to the golden snub-nosed monkey to determine whether um, changes were loss of function, missense or synonymous. And this, this blue one here is Roxolana um, and this is just different um, populations, but we're just we can look just at the blue one, for example. And you can see that there's variation. So what they've done here is they've mapped the loss of function to synonymous. They're looking at these ratios. And here they've mapped the missense to synonymous. And um, in both of these cases, Roxella um, had lower levels of mutational load despite having high levels of inbreeding. So they highlight here that the inbreeding does not necessarily lead to high levels of mutational load, or maybe it's able to purge it. Um, but what they did find was that genes containing homozygous loss of function mutations um, were related to, to the immune system. But these are just a couple of case studies to highlight um, how you can get a better understanding of the, the functional change of a particular SNP. So the other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the phenotypic traits under selection, they're not just 
um, impacted by a single mutation. Often there's polygenic underpinnings. So we often want to think about the landscape of adaptive ge um, genetic variation. And, you know, this is where sort of that correlation doesn't equal causation. Most SNPs that we find aren't under selection, but are often found near a gene or regulatory region. They're in proximity, but they're not necessarily the cause. So, um, you know, one of my favorite, and I think this is really an exciting opportunity for our field moving forwards is really being able to have a better understanding and appreciation of the heterogeneity across the genome and using these kind of sliding or moving window approaches um, so that you can understand um, across the genome how processes or evolutionary processes change. Um, and this is a particular interest to me because I'm really interested in structural variation. So thinking about rearrangements and the role, for example, of an inversion in um, suppressing recombination or driving a, a adaptation and selection on a region. So these approaches um, are really powerful, I think, in trying to tease apart what's happening. And, you know, I showed this slide yesterday in our talk. Um, we know that the genome is heterogeneous. It's got different selective pressures, different gene flow, um, different mutation rates, recombination rates, all the rest. So these sliding window analyses are really powerful and enable us to look in more detail along the genome at how that variation and how evolutionary processes differ. So, you know, the other thing is that with all this data, it's a lot more computationally intensive, um, but the, you can break it up into these sliding windows to kind of have this insight. So you can use these sliding window analyses with whole genome data or with SNP data. We just have to keep in mind, you know, now we've mapped our SNPs to the reference. How frequent are they? Um, what's the appropriate size of our sliding windows, et cetera? You can trial different window sizes. You've got to estimate sort of linkage disequilibrium. But what this does is it allows us to break up the genome into these computational um, these feasible windows, and then um, you can start to address different questions along, you know, your evolutionary continuum. So here's just one example. I often think about processes of speciation. You know, there's this model of um, speciation with gene flow or islands of speciation. So we might see patterns that emerge um, just in parts of the genome where we've got um, increased divergence, which could be driving either adaptation or reproductive isolation. And then through time, you might see variation um, change depending on how far into that process they are. But doing these sliding windows, we can start to look across the genome as to, you know, which regions have different levels of gene flow or divergence and what's the evolutionary consequence for that. So for the next part of the talk, I'm just um, I'm conscious of time here, but this is just one example and there's lots of pipelines out there. I've just found this, um, do I have here? Yeah, um, I've used Simon Martin's Genomics General. This is on GitHub. His site, it's just really user-friendly. He's got a Python script. I found it really easy to follow. Um, this is what it looks like from his site. You basically take your VCF file, which you can get from Dart R, and then you input that. He's got a conversion script to get it in this .geno format, which it's basically like a VCF, but it slightly changes how things look in the file. Um, so you run through, I'm not going to go in detail, but this just to highlight some of what can be done and then some examples from my data of the outputs. So this takes your VCF file and you can look at sliding windows of diversity and divergence metrics. So you give it the window size that you want, whether it's in um, actual length or in number of sites, it's variable depending on how you want to pick it. Yeah, coordinates or sites. Um, and for this example, you can estimate 
sliding windows of pi, FST and DXY. And for my stuff, this has been really interesting because we're looking at peaks of divergence associated with chromosome rearrangements. Um, so this is just an example of what you might get. Um, so people want to look at FST or outlier tests to detect selection across the genome. There's a bunch of programs that can do this as well as just this script that I was highlighting from um, Simon Martin's site. There's programs like Base Scan, PC Adapt, Outflank, um, and basically they're looking at um, identifying loci that are under selection. So you might have your sort of um, your chromosome along here, and then you get your measure of divergence. These are measures of FST, and you have a threshold. And if you've got a peak that's above that threshold, it could be suggestive that this is um, a locus under selection. That might be important. You can sort of place. We've got annotated genomes. Like, is 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 it associated with a particular um, genotype function? Um, so these are the sorts of approaches of what people do. They look for these outliers and you can do that in this sliding window approach. So this is just to kind of give you an overview here. So I mentioned I've been researching these rock wallabies and we're particularly interested in um, the role of the chromosome rearrangements in driving speciation. So um, we're really fortunate we have a lot of carrier type information but now we're trying to understand, well, what's the genic evolution? And, you know, we're expecting that there's um, recombination suppression. We're expecting that there's peaks of differentiation within the chromosome rearrangement. So we're interested in comparing inside and outside these regions that have been rearranged. So we've been looking at this species complex in Northeast Queensland, where there are six species. This is just, look, you know, they've got different chromosomes. They have different fusions. Here's a 610 fusion. This species here doesn't have it. There's inversions. There's all sorts of different Robertsonian fusions. So we're looking at pairwise differences here and the power of pairwise differences to understand the evolution of these rearrangements. And they, they range from simple, like a single fusion, to more complex where you've got whole big... Um, monobrachial homology here. So this is just to kind of give you a bit of a background to our results. So what we have is, you know, we've managed to create these reference genomes. I thought when we got them amazing, these are so good. But this is one of those cases where, you know, you, we have to be aware of the limitations of our references. So this group, macropods in general have really repetitive regions, particularly around the centromeres. They've been extremely challenging to sequence. Um, really, it's only with the long read sequencing now, and this is what we're coming back to, um, to improve these because we can't address all our questions because our genomes are a little bit fragmented. But anyway, this is just a highlight to you. We have different genomes for different species here. You can see the syntony, the blue parts, which map between the genomes. You can see inversions in red so we know regions of difference this is just like the foundation of where we're at and what we've been really interested in is we've got um resequencing data so we don't have SNP but this is just a highlight you could look at this with SNPs as well and here we have a pairwise comparison between the allied rock wallaby and the mariba rock wallaby we're looking at this first chromosome um chromosome one and we're walking along the chromosome estimating dxy and sliding windows and you can see oh we reach these areas there's some peaks of differentiation they're sort of around this area of the inversion it's kind of interesting we walk a bit further at this end we see this other big peak this was super exciting we got this from population data i followed that chris martin sliding window so this was really interesting but then I realized when we looked at other pairwise comparisons, we get this peak here at the end for all pairwise comparisons, whether or not there's an inversion or not. So this is just a flag that um, we have to be cautious. We now have to come back and check that 
this part of chromosome one is really rich in immune genes and immune regions and could be full of duplication, uh, gene duplications or gene families. So we're not, we now need to come back and check that our reference genomes are accurate here. And this is where some of our coming back and doing long read sequencing will help with that. We're also checking coverage of our mapping. So there's a bunch of things that you can do to check your results. So although this was super exciting, now we're questioning it and we're going back and double checking that, you know, our results are accurate. So it's always good to first analyze, come back, reassess, et cetera. But this is to highlight to you what you can do with that sliding window analysis. So we then did it looking at chromosome six and chromosome nine, which um, in this assembly, they're, they're supposed to be fused. It's a, a Robertsonian fusion, but we see, you know, near the end where the centromere would be fused, there's this peak of differentiation. Um, we see also some differentiation on chromosome six at the end where there could be a slight inversion. So these are pretty exciting technologies and ways to assess um, you know, our links between genetic or genic evolution and the chromosomes. So that's the first example is just measures of genetic differentiation, FST and DXY, which are used broadly in terms of population genetic study um, and thinking about selection. So another valuable approach for these sliding windows is thinking about introgression and I'm not sure if people have spoken about the last couple of days thinking about um, ABBA BABA statistics. So I'm just going to spend a minute and apologies if you've already gone through this. But um, this approach is a, um, a statistical way to assess the probability of gene flow between um, two non-sister lineages. And this has been quite a useful and valuable tool for thinking about speciation with gene flow and the landscape of speciation. So again, this is a Python script within um, Simon Martin's site, and you estimate um, these windows and metrics of ABBA-BABA statistics across the genome. So ABBA-BABA tests, um, also known as D-statistics, are a, a simple and powerful test for assessing deviation from this strict bifurcating evolutionary history. So we're expecting, we've got these four lineages, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. In this scenario here, we have no gene flow. In this one here, we have gene flow. And under a model of no gene flow, we're expecting that the number of ABBA and BABAs is roughly equal because there's a 50% chance that either the lineage from population one or from two coalesce with population three. Um, sorry, what am I saying? That either the lineage from population one or two, two coalesce with the lineage from three in the population ancestral to population one, two, and three. But under introgression, so we're expecting that to be 50-50, whether you get this pattern or this pattern, just because by chance. But if we're if there has been gene flow between lineage three and lineage two here, we're expecting there to be more ABBAs than BABAs because you're having an influx of these um, genes here. So it's a way of teasing apart ILS from introgression. And um, what, we, what you do when you run these analyses is you estimate the numbers of ABBAs and BABAs. In this case, um, you know, there's a significant difference. Your value is greater than it doesn't equal zero um, where we're expecting pretty equal and you get this Z score. So you can run this in these sliding windows to get estimates of um, introgression. And it gives you an understanding of gene flow across the landscape. Um, so here is an example of speciation in sticklebacks. This example is using whole genome data, but you can do it with SNP data. Um, so again, it's doing these sliding windows. Each of these is a chromosome. 
you're getting these metrics. The top one is FST, then DXY. So these are your divergence estimates. And then at the bottom here, you're getting this estimate of the um, D statistic. So we're getting deviations along parts of the genome for areas that could have introgression. So this is just a highlight, you know, they've generated the, the lineage tree. You've got the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean and um, Japanese sea lineages. And then it's trying to understand um, speciation and gene flow between them. So what they found were that um, looking across in those individual loci, there were fewer introgression valleys. So they're looking at these um, D statistics and where they are on those chromosomes. And they found fewer valleys on the Neo X chromosome, which is this pink chromosome here, um, compared to the autosomes. And this is taking into account chromosome length and so on. So there's a bit of interest here that introgression is not uniform across the genome. And it's actually looking like there's less gene flow on the Neo X, so on the sex chromosome. So this kind of highlights the next point. Oh, sorry. And this is just another example here of, you know, looking across these chromosomes and estimating the um, introgression. These blocks in red here are um, evidence for regions of gene flow. And what they actually found in this study was that um, those regions of gene flow are associated with um, particular genes as well. So you can have this adaptive gene flow here. So when you're not just looking at evidence of gene flow and you're able to annotate what's under selection in those regions, you might have adaptive processes happening. And in this case, it was the um, hypoxia inducible factor pathway that integrates from the yak to the Tibetan cattle. So this is just another example to highlight what you can get at from your um, information when you have gene annotations and you're able to piece it together across the genome. Um, I'm conscious I'm almost done. Um, so I'll leave some time for Jason to go through his example. Another package that does this sliding window Ababa as opposed to that Python script is D Suite. So there's other software out there. You can Google and find different software. This is another useful one that I've run with. Um, and again, it takes your VCF file and information of what you're comparing and it estimates those. So lastly, I'm just going to go through um, thinking about in sliding windows, the phylogenetic tree and the discordance and what that can mean. So, um, you know, this we're talking yesterday in the session about gene trees versus species trees and thinking about why you might have different processes associated with um, mutation rates or areas under selection or differences in recombination rates. So you might get different coalescent ancestry and incomplete lineage sorting and all the rest. So people are interested in understanding where is everything concordant with the species tree and where is it different and why. So I found this interesting software um, online which uses RAD data, DDRAD data. And what it does is this red dot here is the species tree and then it maps out all of the other phylogenetic trees um, in your sliding windows in relation to the, the species tree. So it gives you a bit of a summary overview of um, the tree space and do subsets of the data support different trees. And then where there's discrepancies, they could be indicators for biological processes of um, gene flow or hybridization and incomplete lineage sorting. So this is just one tool to think about and visualize and look at um, tree space. So when thinking about tree space, I really love this paper, although it's not um, DDRAD data, what this paper on Anopheles gambiae showed was that um, the, the species tree in this scenario was associated with the X chromosome, but it's a small part of the genome that actually formed this species tree. So 
knowing where your loci is and the processes and the outcomes of that is really powerful for trying to distinguish at the phylogenetic scale what's the species tree and what's the true evolutionary history um, versus, you know, other patterns like incomplete lineage sorting and so on. But this just highlights, and we haven't sort of touched on this, you know, mapping to reference genomes where you do have the sex chromosomes can be really powerful. I mean, the sex chromosomes, um, not, you know, not everything's XY, I realize that, but there are different processes happening on those sex chromosomes where you've got heterogametic and homogametic sexes. Um, there's different recombination, mutation, effective population size selection. So those processes can be different from the autosomes. And our theoretical predictions of what's happening on the, for example, the X chromosome versus autosomes in terms of accumulating mutations, um, they might accumulate faster on the X chromosome or, you know, have impacts of um, recessive or partially recessive mutations being more efficient or being masked. Um, so being able to map to these references and having references that encompass the heterogametic sex is really powerful for thinking about these different processes on sex versus um, autosome chromosomes. And this is something I've been particularly interested in thinking about this faster X effect, um, where we're predicting from population genetics theory that the X plays a disproportionate role in speciation and divergence. And um, I'm just going to finish again with the rock wallaby example um, where, you know, our preliminary results do somewhat suggest maybe there's some effect. This is a measure of genetic divergence on X chromosome here versus autosomes. There's higher differentiation on this X chromosome when accounting for um, length of data that we used. Um, so there could be something here in this system. There's sort of mixed literature around this, but the only way we can get at this is because we can map to references. Um, down the bottom here is the X chromosome sliding window for um, these two species here. And we do see some peaks of differentiation. So this is something we're exploring further. And really um, this just nicely highlights how we can start to really get at some of these longstanding questions um, in evolutionary theory, because we can now map to these reference genomes. So with that, I'm sure you've all had enough of hearing my voice. Um, hopefully I've highlighted to you some of the powers of where we're headed now that we can um, have information about where SNPs are located, thinking about considerations of what are we using as a reference and how far can we take it? And then, yeah, really the ability to push forward with understanding heterogeneity and evolutionary processes across the genome as well as functional evolution.